So 1 John chapter 3, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a great God you are to us. And uh, I truly cannot wait to see you. I truly cannot wait to check out of here and to spend an eternity with you. Lord, so many things go on down here. You walked among us. Lord, you know the 30 plus years you spent on this earth. You showed us how to live here. But Lord, it sure is getting difficult. And God, I'm going to ask that you would just do a work in our lives. And Lord, as I listen to Brother Johnson preach, and Lord, when I looked at the verse in light of what he was saying, I thought to myself, I wonder if I have looked at the will of God the right way in my life. And God, I want to thank you. I just want to thank you that you have been good to every one of us. And Lord, I ask that tonight that you would do the work we cannot do. Lord, do the eternal in such a short time. This night too will pass. We will return to our houses. We will go back to our daily routine. But God, help us never to forget what's going on. Do something in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 14. We know, I want you to say those two words together out loud with me. What are they? We know. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we what? Love. There is something about being born and being young and it's correlated to being born again. When we're young, we love. When we're young, we love unconditionally. When we're young, we like to hug. When we're young, we like to give kisses. When we're young, we are just all about crawling up into a lap and snuggling. You will not understand this young person until you have a child. You definitely will not understand it until you have grandchildren. I didn't know how much I could love until I met my wife. I didn't know how deep my love went until I had children. And I had no idea how fanatical my love was until I had grandchildren. I used to hear my dad say all the time about my, his grandchildren when they were younger. He would say, son, if I knew grandchildren were this fun, I would have skipped you and had them first. And I'm like, what, is, what am I, chopped liver? He said, every time when it comes next to the grandchildren. <laughs> Love, hereby we know that we've passed from death into life because we what? Love. I will tell you this, if you don't have a built-in love, I, I would check my salvation. Be because you were never meant not to love. You can't have the definition of love for God so loved. You can't have the definition of love living on the inside of you without it oozing out your spiritual pores and without you loving. Hereby we know we pass from death into life because we love the brethren. So that means we can hate our sisters as long as we love our brothers. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Look at this. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life. It is one thing to love. It's another thing for it to dawn on you this perception of love. Young person, I'm headed down a path of thought in our scripture tonight, so kind of hang on with me. Love. It's a wonderful thing to love. It's a wonderful thing for it to be unconditional love, and that's what you were when you were younger. You, you would just run up and jump in people's laps and when you were younger, and we all have something in common. Are you ready? We used to be cute. We used to be lovable. We used not to judge or withhold our love. We would love. And the Bible's saying this in 1 John. He's saying, look, when you perceive the love of God and what it took when he laid down his life. Young person, listen, I'm about to tell you. There's a wonderful dawning that will happen in your life when you think about Calvary and you think about what Jesus Christ did for you and you think about that kind of love. There, there's something about, there's something wonderful about it. He said this, you know that you're, that you're saved when you pass from death to life because you love. And then when you perceive this love, 
Then if you'll keep going, look what it says. When he laid down his life, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But who shall hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shut it up with his bowels of compassion from him? How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, look at this. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in what? Truth. Think about this. You started out as a person of love. The day you got saved, you now had eternal love, and there's something fresh about being saved. There's something wonderful about being saved because you have love on the inside, and love is meant to grow, and love is meant to overflow its banks. Look right up this way. Look right up this way. Love is meant to overflow its banks. That's why you have to be very careful when you young people interact with each other because love was meant to grow. And if you start down this journey of giving your heart to someone of the opposite gender, you only have two years at the most, and it starts working against you. But you know what? It's kind of hard to get married when you're 14. Love was meant to grow. You, 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 you're, you're, you love. And then when you get saved, this love and this perception of Jesus dying on the cross. Remember when songs about Calvary and songs about the love of God just warmed your heart? Then when you perceive it, then you're like, I got to do something for somebody. I just have to be kind to somebody. Look what it says there. But I'm just not going to be kind in tongue, but I'm going to become kind in deed and in truth. Look at the momentum that is being built when we get to verse number 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall, what's the next word please? Assure our what? Hearts before who? Him. The average problem with teenagers is this, and I'm going to help you tonight. You get on this momentum roll that says this, I love, I want to express this love. The more you express this love, the more that love comes out, you express it with people. And then you start, you get this euphoria on the inside that says, man, I just love the Lord and I love everybody around me. And I just have this, this, this blonde view of life that everything's great and I don't understand everything. And you just love then how come the momentum doesn't keep up and carry through to your senior year? We have to admit that when you're in seventh grade, everything's fun, everything's exciting. Eighth grade, everything's fun and everything's exciting. But something truly happens to the teenage world that the older you get, the less you love and the less you show that love and the less... You want people to show that love to you. No teenage guy wants a pair of 45-year-old lips coming at him to kiss him. But when you were younger, you were like, Mama, can I have a kiss, please? And you would stick your lips out, except you. You would stick your lips out. And you would go, Mama. And your mama would come up, and she would put a kiss on the side of your cheek, and she would leave red lipstick Prince, big old, and by the way, you know how old your mama is? Is when she kisses you on the side of the cheek, just count the cracks in the lips, amen? That was wrong, wasn't it? Just a second. Bad Bob. And, but, but, but the older you get, it's like, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, don't put your arm on me. Don't kiss me. Stay, don't hug me. What happened to the little person that you were all about love? There was a time you'd share your candy bar with people. There was a time that you would say, no, 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 they don't have anything. Let's give it to them because you were full of love and you perceived love that Jesus loved you and gave you and you had to give it to somebody else. What happened? The same thing that happens to every Christian all of a sudden, and I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 17, if you will, and then we're coming back to 1 John. Jeremiah chapter 17 It is the Achilles heel of every adult in this auditorium that at one time you used to be more in love with Jesus Christ than what you are right now. It is the problem, teenager, that you're going to have to deal with the older you get. Do you not want to go back to being that loving person? 
Are you tired of being a grouch? Are you tired of being that son that you are 17, 18 years of age, 16 years of age, and you won't let mama hug you, and you won't let mama kiss you, and you don't want anybody to touch you? Your father can't even come up and put his arm around you without you just get. I'm a man. Don't do that. Listen, I'm about to tell you. When you perceive love and you loved on the inside and you had an unadulterated, pure love of God going on in your life, you didn't mind being touched by your mama and your daddy. And you didn't mind helping people. But you have turned into a selfish animal that now you don't want to share anything. Get away from me. Don't do that. That's mine. That's my seat. Get away from me. Don't wear my stuff. I, I don't want... Listen to this. It is the problem every Christian faces. You know what the problem is? Jeremiah 17, verse 9, look at it. The heart is what, please? Deceitful above what? All things. Oh, and look at this next thing. And desperately what? Wicked. What does the Bible say about your heart? It is what? Deceitful and it is desperate. Say those two words with me. What is your heart? Your heart is what? Deceitful and your heart is what? Desperate. It is deceitful. It will deceive you and trick you into doing things, listen to this, that you didn't even think you were capable of doing. So when you go back to 1 John chapter 3, which I want you to go back there now, you started out with love. Because you got saved. You started out with this deep, passionate love for the Lord. You started out with this love that you didn't mind it overflowing your banks. And you showed everybody that you love. You love so much that you did things for people. You love so much. And then all of a sudden, it's like somebody put the brakes on. And you now came to a halting position in your life to where what happened to you? You no longer are a person of love. You used to sing those songs like the top of your lungs. You used to stand up there and you used to stand in that choir. You used to sing in that group and you would get up there with all the love of God. What has happened? The heart is two things. What are the two things the heart is? The heart is deceitful and the heart is what? Desperate. Zeke, I'm going to use you because I didn't bring you all this way to let you sit there. Get up here, man. Only because I know if I beat you up, your mama won't sue me. Here is, go all the way to that speaker. Here is the Achilles heel. Your heart, listen to this, the center of your feelings. The center, ma'am, of who you in essence you are. Your will, your intellect, your feelings. The Bible says it's very deceitful i'm gonna play the part of the heart at this point and 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 the heart will convince you just walk slowly to do things the heart will get you to feel and the heart will get you to do and over a period of time it will use listen to this your love against you it will use that love and that embracing and I'll do anything for Jesus Christ. And the heart is so desperate and the heart is so deceitful and desperate that it will convince you to do. The sermon's not long tonight. And then once you cross a line, it now turns on you and condemns you. Are you there in 1 John chapter 3? Look what it says. We perceive the love of God. The love of God has made us love the brethren. The love of God has overspilled our life to now we've got to do things for people. We, we know that we just can't do it in tongue, but we have to do it in deed and in truth. We know and we're assured in our hearts, well, this is going great. But look at verse 20. For if our heart, what? Talk to me now. For if our heart, what? Do you know what the average teenager, the reason that you no longer love? 
you no longer, you can't get it back. You can't get that mojo back. That's what we call it in East Texas. You can't get that momentum back. You can't find that person that used to be you. You can't find the motivation. You can't find it. And I'm going to tell you why. Because your heart, go back to the other side, your heart deceived you and your heart tricked you into doing something because it's desperately wicked so it deceives you to cross a line and it tells you you can be the exception it'll be okay then as soon as you do it flips you and it condemns you and it fills you full of so much guilt that it tells you you were a hypocrite back there you used to love God and you used to want to do things for God but you're a hypocrite and it makes you feel guilt. Because the only person that knows the true you is you. The only person that knows your darkest day is you. And there is something about betrayal that won't let you move forward. There is something, you ask the adults in this room, and even the adults in this room that said, you know, I used to be in love, and, and I used to be in love, and I used to demonstrate that love, and I used to be on the momentum, and I've just lost my momentum. And I'm going to tell you why people lose their momentum in the Christian life. It's because they cross a line and do something that in their, in their wildest dreams, they thought that that won't happen to me. Listen to this young person. You take the worst thing that you could that you have ever thought of somebody doing, and on your weakest day, you can do that. You can become that. Then all of a sudden, there is this thing that's built into us that says, I, 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 I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I, I am not going to be a hypocrite. And there are a lot of teenagers and there's a lot of Christians who no longer are doing for the Lord. They are no longer have that confidence. They no longer have that love. They no longer have that joy. And they are self. They are isolated. They are sad. They are unhappy. They walk around with a cloud over them and they just can't break free from the guilt because they crossed a line that they promised themselves they would never cross. I mean, they started out, go back to the, they started out being very vocal and public about their love for the Lord. But we all have one thing in common. You know what that is? Your heart. Your heart is deceitful. And look at Jeremiah 17. If you go back there, don't go back there, but let me read you the very last part. Who can know it? Do you know what the Bible tells us? What is living on the inside of you is so powerful that it will deceive you and it's desperate and you don't even know it. Don't raise your hand, but can I ask you a question? I want you to go back to the darkest day in your life. And I want you to go back to the darkest day, the thing that you said to yourself that you look in the mirror and when you men shave yourself in the mirror or you ladies are putting on your makeup and you may be looking at your physical, but it goes much deeper than that. It goes all the way back to those times and maybe it's just one time, maybe it's three times and you think to yourself, I am such a hypocrite. I cannot believe you did that. I cannot believe you went there. I I cannot believe you said that. I cannot believe that you are this person. How do you even live the Christian life? And there was a time when your love was growing. Your love was passionate. Your love was incredible. You had no qualms about getting up and doing things for the Lord, but now you've retreated to the corner of life and you're letting everybody else love except you. The Bible says this, if our heart condemn us, then I want you to look at the next part of the verse. Look what it says there. For if our heart condemn us, woo, did you see it right there? What is the next part of that verse? Read it out loud, 1 John 3, 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our, what, heart and 
Read the rest of it. And knoweth. Did you, do you, do you have any idea what that just told us? It just told us that if you're the person that your heart tricked you and then it flipped on you and it condemned you. Jack, if y'all can come back up. And it condemned you. And now your guilt won't let you rise any higher. Your guilt won't make you be public with your love. Your guilt. You know what the Bible says? God is greater than our what? Heart. And, and, and look at the beautiful thing. Look at, look at if the pianist can come back and, and the trio come back up. Look at the beautiful thing here. I'm going to give you an illustration and, and then we're going to be done. Look at the beautiful thing. God already knows. L listen, we think that God, come back, come back. We think that God is absent. We think God is absent through this whole journey of us loving. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Perfection is never required in the Christian life. Look right at this way. Perfection is never required in the Christian life. Only honesty. Amen. Young person, you don't have to be perfect. There's nothing in this book that says never sin. It just says don't let sin reign in your mortal body. It just simply says don't let sin have dominion. You'll always be a sinner. Your heart will always deceive you. It will always condemn you. But God is greater than your heart and he knoweth all things. He was there at your darkest day. He was there at your darkest night. When you look into the mirror of life and you can't believe you did that. And you can't believe you become that. God goes, I was there. And the greatest thing I could ever tell a Christian is this. You still got love. You just got to deal with the guilt of your humanity. God is greater. We need to have teenagers that get back to loving God. Expressing that love like you used to. I'm going to let you have a seat right there. Why don't you all come back up. Get, got your mics. Get your mics. Can I show you every time that a teenager and you, you get up to sing or do anything for the Lord? Because you still got it in you to do for the Lord. You still got it in you. You, you still want to, y'all scoot down, scoot down, y'all scoot, scoot down, I'm coming in. Y'all still got it in you to love the Lord. But you know why there's no <clears throat> in loving the Lord. In fact, are you there in 1 John chapter 3? Open your Bible, you got large print. Lord have mercy. Look what it says there. Beloved, verse number 20. For if our heart condemn us, are you there? Because I'm going to have you read it. God is what? Greater than our heart. I'm going to illustrate this. Look at it. It says there. Beloved, verse 21. If our heart condemn us, what? Not. Then have we, what's the next word? Confidence. Do you know when you were just a little thing, you loved the Lord and you had confidence about it? It's time to make the full circle and deal with the guilt and deal with the issues and deal with the nights you wish you could take back. And let's get back on track and let's get the confidence back. Let's get the love back and let's chase hell back to where it needs to go. And let's put the devil on the run and let's make our churches exciting again. But I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes when Christians understand, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I'm not perfect. Yes, I make mistakes. But I am not going to sit on the sidelines of life because I crossed a line or had a dark night. No, I am going to rise up. I'm getting back to loving again. Because if our heart condemn us not, Amen. then we have what? Confidence. Someone said the other day, boy, you preachers sure are cocky. Listen to this. No, we're not. We are just confident. Because we know the source of our confidence. And it is the Lord. But here is your Christian life in a nutshell. You know you. Your heart knows you. But you can't serve the Lord. Go ahead, brother. Y'all just go ahead and start singing. 
So here you are, you're trying to serve the Lord. and So I'm going to bless people. So they're going to bless people. what you've done and here you're trying to serve the Lord but the guilt won't let you do it and the reason there's no confidence in our churches is because your heart is right there next to you seriously so you're going to think that you're going to get up here and sing you know who you are I was there the night you crossed the line you might as well go sit down. You, you might as well stop singing because they're not hearing you because of your life. You might as well go sit down. Go sit down. We, we don't even want to hear you. And you keep trying. But you're incomplete. And your heart keeps willing away at you. You might as well go sit down. Go, just go sit down. Just go sit down. And you might as well stop too. Go sit right here. And how many teenagers have gone to the sideline because of guilt. How many of you adults here tonight, you've been sitting on the sideline for years because you think you're unworthy because of guilt? And I'm here to tell you that God never required perfection. He only requires honesty because all of us are human and under the right circumstance and the right time you can do some of the dumbest things but God knows everything when the heart stand up Zeke when the heart deceives you and you cross that line and then it flips you and goes, you'll never glorify your God again because you're a hypocrite. And I'll always remind you, always. And if you even try to love again, and you even try to be that person again, Zeke, I will whisper in your ear the night that you and I both know. Mama doesn't know, Daddy doesn't, but we know. So what is the answer? Here it is. God, God, I want to love again. I just want to love again. And God, I cannot do it because the guilt is too much. I'm sorry. If I could take back, I would take it. I'm sorry. But God, I'm tired of this guilt and this condemnation, I can't take it anymore. And God, I need you. And then from there, teenager, it's a whole nother life. Because when you just get honest, Zeke, I'm going to let you play the heart. So go down there. Go sit next to that girl back there. You're going to play the heart. Do exactly what I did. The Bible says this. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Look at it. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we, what is the next word, please? Confidence. 1 John 3, 21. Then we have what? Confidence toward who? God. Look at verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are what? Pleasing. Look at the prepositional phrase there, in whose sight? His sight. I'm done. Sermon's only been 20 
right at 30 minutes right now. Y'all get back up and sing and go the distance this time. Are you ready? Go ahead, y'all. When you get honest with the Lord, you can love again. I'm going to tell you why. Because of this one fact. Now that everything's in the open, you've told the Lord and you've said, Lord, I, I, I want you to know I'm sorry. But I'm done sitting on the sideline. Then when your heart decides to condemn you, what does the book say? God is what? Greater. So do you know where that shield is? It's God. Leave him alone. They're serving me right now. And you can get your love back because God is greater than your heart. And, and, and you need to get back to where you used to be. You used to be loved. You used to express love. You used to want people around you. But you've lost it because guilt is robbing you of some of the best times of your life. Let God be greater than your guilt. Because when God knows everything, all he's looking for you to do is just admit it. And I promise you, there'll come a day when God will keep pushing the guilt and just keep saying, leave him alone. Leave him alone and let him bless people. Your life can still be a blessing to people no matter how dark your days are. And I beg you, don't live anymore in guilt. Don't take one more step with one more dark night because you think I did trash, I must be trash. I did wrong, I must be evil. I drank, so I must be a drunk. I kissed a guy, so I must become a whore. That's not true. God is greater than your heart. Everybody's human. Don't live in your depravity. Live in the forgiveness of God. Can I ask you a question? Do you want to go back to loving? Why do you want love anymore? Why don't you express it anymore? I promise you, it is because you think you're done. Young people, listen to this. Old people, listen to this. You're not done as long as the grace of God is greater than your sin. Oh, I meet them all the time. Church members, teenagers, they've lost that gleam in their eye. They've lost that love. They've lost that passion because they truly think, I can't live with the guilt anymore. You don't have to. God's greater than your heart. There needs to be a mighty army rise up that you're done living in the darkness of guilt and you live in the light of his forgiveness. And once you step into it, you're the first one to say, I'm not perfect, never intend to be, but God already knows. Beautiful, that's how mercy saw me. Don't you want to be love again? Nothing better than loving. Nothing better than showing that love. Nothing better than a relationship that you can have with God once again. Whatever you used to be, you can be again. Please, you're at the best time of your life. Thank you. Y'all may have a seat. Let me ask you a question. Aren't you tired of living in guilt? Oh, my mom and dad knew they would hate me. God already knows, and he loves you. I told this story to our church a couple of weeks ago. I was preaching on a certain subject. Last year, one of our seminary students came to me and said, I got to talk to you. I said, absolutely. What do you need? I did something stupid. 
I said, all right, what, what, what happened? He told me what they did. And I looked at him and I said, uh, back during, before the semester ended, and, and I looked at him and I said, look, look, have you taken care of it with the Lord? And they said, yes, but the guilt is tearing me up. And I just do not have my confidence. I do not have my love. And pastor, we all know one and done. And I just started laughing. And I said, who told you that? So you know that one and you're done. And I was like, that may work in tournament play. That doesn't work in the Christian life. So they told me what they did and I prayed with them, gave them a couple of verses, and, and I said, well, you know, I've always told you, you guys and girls at the, at the college that, uh, look, you get a stupid card, and one day when you're stupid, I mean, you're dumb as a box of bricks, and you do something stupid, come see me. We can fix it. Listen to this. You don't, you're not training Bible college students how to build a college. You're teaching them how to build people. And I said, come on. We prayed. We, we, we labored over it in prayer and came up with a game plan. And, and uh, every month they get their demerit record. And so they, they got their demerit record in their box. And 30 days went by. And they're back in my office and they're like, hey, um, it's, it's not it's not on my demerit record. And I was like, what are you talking about? They said, no, no, no. It's not on my demerit record. And I was like, what? They said, you know. And as soon as they said, I was like, oh, yeah, well, do you want it on there? And they were like, no. I said, because I can put it on there and make it part of your permanent file if you want me to put it on there. That's easy. They're like, no, I just cannot believe, Pastor. Listen to what, he, what they said. I cannot believe that forgiveness is that easy. And I said, you know why it's easy? Because you recognized it and we didn't have to do a thing. Tears come running down his eyes. The very next Sunday, I sit on the platform and I have to be careful because Zeke's here. And the, the very next Sunday, I'm sitting on the platform, and he was singing in a group that come walking out. And, and, and I stand, and, and it's just normal for me to joke with the people on, on, on the platform. And, and he come walking by, and, and I said, uh, man, I'm excited about hearing you sing. And he said, I feel like such a weight's off my shoulder. I cannot believe I have this much love on the inside of me. And I said, man, you get up there and you sing for all you're worth. And after he was done and after the group was done and after church I was shaking hands and Brother Ross, a, a, a lady came up to him and we were standing there in the same position. She said, that, that was the greatest song ever. I just think I'm so in love with Jesus Christ right now that I think I could get a whoop whoop for the Lord. He looked at me and he said, and to think that I spent one moment in guilt when forgiveness was that easy. But I know what our fundamental brethren are thinking right now. Well, where was the dungeon chamber that you put them in? And where was the six months of stretching on the rack? Because everybody should be nailed to the wall that does things wrong. Well, I'm glad I don't attend your kind of church. Y'all, let's just face it. You used to love, but guilt has tore you up. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If the pianists come back and just play the song the group was singing.